In today's lecture, we are going to start on chapter six, which is all about consciousness. So as per usual, we'll start with our definitions. So when we're talking about consciousness, we're talking about our awareness of internal and external stimuli. So consciousness can be stuff that we're thinking about inside our heads, or it can be our awareness of things that are outside of ourselves. Um, so both are part of our consciousness. And so consciousness is going to be our subjective awareness of ourselves and our environment. So inside and outside. Um, and awareness plays a pretty important role. Now, now, consciousness has played a very big role in psychology, and it's been important since the very beginning. So a lot of our schools of thought were divided over how we treat consciousness and where does the mind fit? Is it part of the body or separate? Um, consciousness was less cared about when behaviorism was the most common school of thought because behaviorism was focused only on the external environment um, and how the external environment was directly influencing our behavior. But as the cognitive and even biological perspective started looking at how we're determining our behavior, consciousness started to take another strong role in psychology. And so in today's world, consciousness plays a pretty important role in most aspects of psychology. A lot of people care about why we're doing something, what we're thinking about when we're doing it, um, what's going on internally. So if we're talking about consciousness, this is a very abstract concept. So we're starting to get away from things like neurons and um, concrete behaviors, and we're starting to describe something that isn't itself very concrete. So we have a couple of things that we can talk about consciousness being. The first of these is that it's subjective and private. So Private, meaning nobody else can know what it is we're thinking. And subjective means it's sort of our own interpretation of things. So it's our own reality and others can't know it. It's also going to be dynamic. Our consciousness is always changing. We have daily cycles from asleep to awake and back again. But even our consciousness wavers. We will pay attention during a lecture, but maybe we'll zone out and daydream for a while. Um, so that's where the dynamicness comes in. Um, and our consciousness is also self-reflective, which is weird. Our mind is aware of its own consciousness. Um, so we can think about thinking, which takes us down its own rabbit hole. But with all of these qualities, all of these traits of consciousness, if we're going to start looking at it as uh, scientists, if we're going to start thinking about looking at consciousness, how would one go about researching it? How can you actually test for consciousness? Now, with humans, it's a little bit easier than with other animals. We can use what are called self-reports. So we can give someone a questionnaire, we can give them a series of questions, we can go through an interview, and we can ask them to describe things that they are thinking or feeling. So describe your inner experiences. Maybe they can offer some direct insight into their individual and private subjective experiences. So self-reports are good because we can get someone's direct words of what they think they're experiencing. The downside here is you can't tell if somebody is telling the truth. You can't verify the information that they're giving you. Someone could lie about what they're thinking or feeling or experiencing, and we have no way of knowing. So that's something that we have to keep in mind with our self-reports. So if you're putting together a questionnaire, you usually have to include some questions that'll help try and catch some of those falsehoods because some of them aren't even necessarily uh, intentional. So sometimes people don't even know that they're not telling the truth. But that is a story for another day. So another way that we can test for consciousness is using something like a physiological study. So instead of getting people to talk about what they're thinking or feeling, what they're conscious of, 
we can use a um, sort of physical measure of what they're experiencing. So if we can connect the biological processes that are going on within their body to the mental process that should be happening, we can start making some connections. So a really good example of this would be putting someone uh, into an EEG study. So you put an EEG cap on them. That's the electroencephalography back from an earlier chapter where you can measure brain waves by specifically looking at those uh, changes in electrical currents as neurons are actively firing. So these measures can tell us what parts of the brain light up um, or don't light up when people are asked to think about something, or if they're shown something, or if they're doing a particular behavior. Um, and these physiological studies are fantastic because they can give us an objective measure. So instead of subjective, where it's someone's interpretation, here it's objective, meaning that it's something that someone can't really falsify. You can't control the individual neurons in your brain to prevent them from firing when you see a stimulus. So with these objective measures, we aren't really worried about the participants fooling us. The problem is we've now lost that subjectivity. We don't have their interpretation of what's going on. So sometimes you'll see a combination of a physiological study and a self response report study where they'll get the EEG measurements or whatever other kind of physiological measurement they want to use, but they'll do that while asking questions. So they combine and get the best of both worlds. Now, in both of these cases, um, well, more so our self-reports, physiological studies, though we've talked about them in terms of humans, don't just have to happen on humans. Um, there are specialized ways that you could get an EEG cap that would fit, say, a rat. You could look at their neuronal activity as they navigate something, as they um, are shown different objects that are drawing their attention. Um, so you can use these physiological studies on other non-human animals, though self-report not so much. Um, and then our last category of tests that we can use for testing consciousness are behavioral studies. And behavioral studies are a little bit contentious. Um, pretty much everything to do with consciousness can be contentious, um, mostly because if we have our people, if we scroll back here, um, I talked about, you know, behaviorism had their heyday and uh, we didn't focus on consciousness while behaviorism was popular, but as we got back to more cognitive psychology, um, consciousness came back into favor. Though behaviorists and people who mostly follow behaviorism, they haven't completely gone away. There are still people who focus exclusively on the external environment and how we learn from experience with the environment. Um, there are researchers who really dislike the idea of using consciousness to understand behavior. Um, and even um, people that don't completely dismiss consciousness, they might treat it as something that is unstudiable. If you've ever heard of the black box of consciousness, it's the idea of um, accepting that consciousness and our mind is more complex than we could ever hope to comprehend, so we just lock it away and assume we can't understand it. Which seems kind of backwards after we've talked about all of the process and progresses or no progress and processes we've struggled through to get to this point in psychology but there are some people who are still just very against consciousness and this is a very roundabout way of getting us to the problem with our behavioral studies is that we have to make some assumptions um, in humans it's a little bit easier because we know that humans have a concept of self, that they are um, aware of their own consciousness, or another way to say it, that humans have a theory of mind. Um, and that term, theory of mind, is one of those hot-button issues in psychology where 
Um, we can generally agree that humans have a theory of mind because we can talk about our ability to think and we can think about thinking and we have that awareness, but that's kind of where people stop agreeing. Not everyone assumes or can, can wrap their head around the idea of other species other than humans having a theory of mind. Um, and in order to conduct some of these behavioral studies evaluating consciousness in non-human animals, we're assuming that those non-human animals have consciousness, that they have a theory of mind. So I always bring this up because it's something to be aware of, that these are things where different people will have different views on what it is exactly you're measuring with a behavioral study. Um, so I can use an example here. So the most well-known behavioral study for testing consciousness is the Rouge test. And we actually have an image showing the Rouge test down here at the bottom. Um, it's a little bit difficult to see, but we have an orangutan here, and on his forehead he has a red smudge just over one of his eyebrows. Um, and so what happens with this rouge test is that you have your participant, whether it be um, an orangutan, whether it be a toddler, um, whatever you're studying, and you put a mark on their face. Um, I suppose before that, you have to get them familiar with the concept of a mirror. Um, so you show them a mirror, assumedly so that they can realize that the mirror is themselves. Um, and then you put the red on their face, and then the idea is, if they recognize that the thing that they're seeing in the mirror is in fact themselves, then they should notice the red mark and reach up and touch their own face where that mark is. So if they reach out to touch the mirror where the red mark is, then they don't really recognize that that is me. But if they touch their own face, having looked in a mirror and seen that mark, then they've made that connection that the thing I see in the mirror is actually me. Um, and so to get to that point, I'm already talking about a concept of self. And that's part of us inferring a uh, sort of internal state of mind, this consciousness and conscious awareness of self. Um, so our bonuses or our good sides of behavioral studies is they're going to give us objective measures. So it's something that we can observe and record data from and get um, sort of a yes or no answer. If we have the rouge test that either yes, they recognize themselves in the mirror or no, they didn't. But those conclusions have some assumptions built in. The assumption of a theory of mind or an internal consciousness, which is where they get to be uh, troublesome as methods. Now, different schools of thought, different uh, perspectives are going to have different views of what consciousness is. Um, and so we're going to talk about a couple of these. Um, and you can already see where we're starting with our psychodynamic view of consciousness. And so as I said at the very beginning of this course, whenever you see psychodynamic, your mind should immediately think Freud. And of course, Freud was the founder of our psychodynamic view. And so much of his research revolved around consciousness, um, things that we are aware of or not aware of, as the case may be. And so Sigmund Freud's theory of consciousness, using his psychodynamic view, centered around three different levels of awareness. So our conscious are the current mental events that we are aware of. So the stuff that you're thinking right now the things that you are aware of are your conscious thoughts, the things you are conscious of. Next, we have our pre-conscious. And these are going to be events that we're not currently aware of, but could easily be recalled. So if I asked you, what did you have for breakfast this morning? You weren't thinking about what you had for breakfast, but now you are. Um, 
or what did you have for breakfast yesterday if you haven't eaten yet today or whatever but that's something where you weren't actively thinking about it until I asked but it was easy enough for you to pull it from your pre-conscious and into your conscious awareness as you thought about it. And so most of what we know is going on is sitting in our conscious or our pre-conscious just waiting to come into our conscious awareness. But that's not really what Freud cared about. Freud cared about the unconscious, things that are not brought into our conscious awareness. Um, and I have in brackets usually because a lot of early psychodynamic work focused on methods of unearthing the unconscious. So when you have those um, sort of mental images of somebody reclining on an old couch with uh, Freud sitting in his chair with a, uh, a notepad scribbling notes furiously as he asks you questions about your relationship with your mother, that is sort of the, the standard idea of what these sessions would have looked like, where someone was being asked to recount things that they weren't even aware that they remembered. So your unconscious thoughts being dragged out into your consciousness through the psychodynamic process, through these long interview uh, series. Um, now, as we've already established, Freud's theories were not very popular. Um, they were popular in that they got people angry enough to come up with counter theories. So there were a lot of criticisms to this particular aspect of this particular theory. Um, and so, so for some of these criticisms, our behaviorists, they really disliked the idea of conscious mental processes at all. So any theory that was talking about consciousness to try and explain behavior is kind of a dumb theory to any behaviorist. Um, and if they didn't like this reliance on conscious mental processes, they extra hated unconscious mental processes. So they, they disliked every aspect of the psychodynamic view of consciousness. So behaviorists were completely against this. And then even cognitive um, psychologists really didn't like some aspects. Um, and if we take the idea of the psychodynamic field evolving and changing over time, our modern or contemporary psychodynamic so psychologists are also fairly critical of how this theory or how this view originally looked at consciousness. So they might still be okay with the idea of conscious, pre-conscious, and unconscious, but they disliked Freud's focus on unconscious sexual and aggressive urges. So when we started talking about our psychodynamic view way back when, and we said that our unconscious mind is a battle between um, trying to maintain sort of socially appropriate behaviors but also these unconscious desires and urges to do bad and unacceptable things. Um, and so our cognitive psychologists and modern day psychodynamic psychologists didn't like that intense focus. They'd much rather look at consciousness in a more broad sense. So how does it affect your behavior overall, not just focusing on one particular aspect? So if they didn't like that psychodynamic view, what else can we look at? Um, so we could look at a cognitive view. And so in contrast to our psychodynamic view, something that came out of a general dislike for Freud's view, um, our cognitive view looks at both conscious and unconscious as two parts of a unified whole. So our conscious mind and our unconscious mind work together to allow us to function in everyday life. So we have two different forms of processing information, things that we are conscious of or aware of, and things that are happening in the background, things that are happening automatically. And so we can talk about controlled, also sometimes called effortful processing, 
as part of our consciousness. Um, And when we're using our controlled processing, we are intentionally trying to do something. So it is a voluntary use of attention. You're using your controlled processing to force yourself to listen to this lecture. Um, And our controlled processing is good because um, it allows us to have some flexibility. So maybe you didn't quite hear what I said. Um, So you want to listen back to a part of the lecture, or maybe you want to um, make a note so that you can take what you're hearing and put it down on paper. So your controlled processing, you're focusing your attention to allow you to change up what you're writing, to um, condense what you're hearing into something that's useful. So it's nice and flexible. The downside is it's an active process. It's going to take time to happen. You have to put that effort into it and it's going to require you to be conscious and aware of every step of the process. Now, this makes a little bit more sense when we talk about the contrasting side or the other side of it, the things that we are not really conscious of. So this is our automatic processing. So things that are happening with minimal conscious awareness. Um, And this is the idea of um, maybe you're walking to school and you've walked the same route every day for months, so you don't even think about taking that particular path, it just happens. And before you know it, you've arrived at school and you don't remember the process because it happened automatically. It happened without your conscious involvement. And this automatic processing is what allows humans to be so good at doing many, many tasks all at once. Um, So we can do things in the background without wasting a lot of our attention, without focusing on these tasks. It just happens. Um, A fantastic example of switching between automatic processing and controlled processing is when you're walking down the stairs. Usually, walking down a flight of stairs is going to use your automatic processing. Our muscles know what to do and your brain just lets them do it. If you pause and think about the fact that you're walking down stairs, your brain kicks in, you're paying attention, and you switch over to this controlled processing, and all of a sudden it's a lot harder not to trip down the stairs. So you've switched from using one system to using the other, And we find it more difficult. There's a lot more involved in going down the stairs than we would like. Um, So our effortful processing can be helpful because it lets us be adaptive and flexible, but it's a lot slower and it requires more energy. Our automatic processing, on the other hand, is going to be very fast. Um, It requires very minimal input. It happens sort of the back of our mind. We're not even aware of it. But the problem is, It's only good for tasks that don't require us to intervene. Um, So we can walk down the flight of stairs, no problem, until we encounter a spill on one of the steps. Then we have to change our approach because all of a sudden our usual process of going down the stairs would put us in that puddle, would make us slip. So we have to stop and leave our automatic processing system to change our behavior. Um, Another example would be driving. If you've ever driven, um, if once you've gotten past the first, say, six months of driving, it starts to become um, second nature. You're checking your mirrors without thinking about it. You're keeping speed without thinking about it. That's all happening automatically. Um, But if on your drive home, there has been an accident and you're rerouted onto a different street, You can't use your automatic processing to get home anymore because your normal route has been disrupted. So because you can no longer use that static built-in route that you would take, you now have to go over to controlled processing to find a flexible solution. All right, Um, and so if we're talking about our ability to have things happen in the back of our mind, it naturally ties us over to the idea of divided attention. 
So if you can do something without spending a lot of attention on it, if it's in the back of your mind, well, why not do something with that freed up attention? Um, and in fact, being able to focus on multiple tasks at once is adaptive. It helps us survive because we could mindlessly um, harvest berries because that's a repetitive task while still watching for predators. Um, nowadays, we could, um, I don't know, color a coloring page while listening to a lecture. So you can do multiple tasks at once, and your concentration doesn't suffer too badly. Um, we run into some problems, especially if our tasks require similar resources. So if you are sitting here listening to the lecture, and your phone buzzes, if you look to read the text to see who it was that texted you, all of the parts of your brain that are involved in um, language interpretation are going to start ignoring the lecture to focus on the text. And when you come back to the lecture, you'll find that you've missed out on a couple of seconds of talking and maybe now you're lost. So if our tasks are requiring similar resources, um, then there are some limits to our divided attention. And this is uh, where the textbook goes into a long rant about um, the, the problems that can come from this and how um, something like distracted driving is a bad case of divided attention. So I won't go the same preachy way that the textbook goes, but I do want to talk about it because this is another fantastic example of divided attention. So when you're driving, just driving the car is a whole bunch of other automatic processes. So once you've learned to drive, you check your mirrors unconsciously. You watch your speed unconsciously. You're surveying the area around your vehicle for potential threats. Vehicles turning, uh, kids playing sports, whatever. You're watching all of these things without being aware that you're watching these things. But if there's something that's pulling your attention, and taking your focus away from being available for all of those other tasks, um, then you might not notice when you need to pay attention to something external to the vehicle. So if you are looking at your phone, if you're focusing on reading a text, you might not notice that someone's about to step off the curb. Um, and so using a cell phone can take away important mental resources that you need to drive because driving is already a divided attention kind of activity. You're already um, using so many different resources on so many different tasks that splitting your attention further is very hazardous. 